Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 19th meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I ask you please to ensure that all your mobile phones are on silent? We have apologies this morning from two members, Fulton McGregor and Gail Ross. The first item on the agenda is Forestry and Land Management Bill Scotland. Uh, this was introduced to the Scottish Parliament on the 10th of May. To begin the committee's scrutiny of the bill, we are going to take evidence from the Scottish Government's bill team, the Forestry Commission and Forest Enterprise Scotland. We have a large panel in front of us. Uh, Carol barker munro the bill manager. Ginny Gardner, the head of Forestry Devolution. Catherine Murdoch, the deputy bill manager. Gemma McAllister, uh, solicitor. Joe O'Hara, the head of the Forestry Commission in Scotland and Simon Hodge, the Chief Executive of Forest Enterprise uh, uh, Scotland. Now, the, the committee has a lot of questions and, and it is a large panel, so I would ask witnesses to try and catch my eye uh, if they want to speak, and I, I will bring them in. I would also urge, uh, sorry, urge uh, the committee and witnesses to keep the answers as, as, as short as uh, to the questions as possible and the committee to keep the questions as short as possible. Uh, we're going to move straight into uh, questions, if I may, and, uh, or sorry, into themes uh, regarding the bill, and Rhoda's going to start. My questions um, go around the consultation and what has come out of the consultation. Can I ask um, what was in the consultation that has been dropped subsequently from the bill? In terms of the consultation, we had three, uh, three themes. Um, the, the one that's particularly relevant to the bill is the legislation and regulation element of that. And we haven't dropped anything that was in the consultation from what's gone into the bill. So there was a commitment on sustainable forest management, uh, a long-term commitment to forestry, and um, a commitment that the details of regulation would be taken out of primary legislation and put into secondary legislation. Um, they were the main points under legislation and regulation and they're still in the bill. There were, if I can just say a little bit more about the other two elements. So we also made um, proposals for organisational structures. They are not, not in the bill because our proposals are to bring the structures into the Scottish Government. That makes them have the same legal identity as Scottish ministers, and therefore we don't need to uh, have an identity for public the public bodies in the bill. The other element is on cross-border arrangements, and they're um, subject to negotiation with our colleagues in UK and Welsh Government. Um, we will require a Scotland Act order to set them up, but again, we don't have anything, need anything in the legislation. Um, what um, is in the bill that wasn't consulted on and what, how did you subsequently consult on that and get feedback? As the, as the SPICE briefing I think alludes to, we didn't specifically mention a forestry strategy in the consultation. We did mention a long-term commitment to forestry. In the course of our discussions with stakeholders, um, there were some concerns that um, short-term political timeframes would affect the long-term commitment to forestry and we sought to allay those concerns by including a statutory duty to prepare a forestry strategy. So it's in line with, with um, feedback we received from the, the responses. Okay. And what was the most controversial issue in the consultation? What received the most feedback? And I suppose some things would have received a lot of feedback and support, but what appeared most controversial? The, um, the proposals on organisational structures, um, the, uh, we had a yes, no question on that and the, the majority of organisations supported the proposals. The majority of individuals did not support those proposals. Um, the main issues I would say that, that they fed back on was a concern about loss of expertise and skills. Um, and we, uh, the Scottish Ministers believe that our proposals for organisational structures um, to deal with that issue. We have made a commitment that um, all members of staff from Forestry Commission Scotland and Forest Enterprise Scotland will transfer um, to the Scottish Government. Um, Scottish Ministers have made a commitment that the local office network will be 
retained and therefore the local engagement and knowledge that already exists will be retained. Um, and uh, the, the other issue that uh, people spoke about was um, separating or uh, were want wanting to keep um, Forestry Commission Scotland and Forest Enterprise Scotland making them a single body. Um, Scottish ministers um, already see that them as separate bodies with separate functions and um, keeping them separate also responds to um, feedback we had from stakeholders about separating the regulator, which is the Forestry Commission Scotland element just now, and the regulated, which is the Forest Enterprise Scotland element. Um, I understand what you're saying about expertise, and on day one, the expertise will be exactly the same. But how do you continue that expertise going forward as part of government? How do you continue having, making sure foresters are in a position of influence within the, the Scottish government as civil servants move around? So I think there's two elements to that. Um, the first thing is that there are already a lot of specialists within the Scottish government. Um, it's quite normal to have groups of specialists with um, continuing professional development, uh, in, you know, procurement specialists, lawyers like Gemma, um, and accountants, that side of things. So it's not unusual to have a group of specialists within Scottish government. I don't think there's um, that would change. Um, and the second thing is that we do recognise the importance of skills and uh, we have a commitment to retain that with, within the Scottish Government. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the, uh, the next theme, which is going to be led by John Mason. Uh, thanks so much, convener. And um, I wanted to look at uh, part two of the bill and the whole question of forestry functions and forestry strategy. And so firstly, can you tell us if, if the functions are moving from the forestry, forestry commissioners to the ministers, eh, are these functions the same or are, are they different in any way? Um, they're, they're, they're different in that they're modernised. Um, forestry commissioners at the moment have um, functions which have been layered up over time um, since the 1967 Act. So in bringing them to Scottish ministers, um, the opportunity has been taken to... Um, put a, general, a, a main general duty on Scottish Ministers for Sustainable Forest Management, which recognises um, the inherent balance within forestry and it links to sustainable development of economic, social and environmental objectives. So that, that's, that's a different type of duty, but um, it's still a principal duty on Scottish Ministers to um, promote forestry and to take, a, take account of the various outcomes that forestry can, can contribute to. Um, the second duty, the duty to prepare a forestry strategy, that is a new duty. Um, there is a forestry strategy at the moment prepared by the Forestry Commission, but there's no statutory requirement to do that. Um, so that would be a, a, a new duty on Scottish ministers. So in terms of part two, those are the, the main two duties that, that will be placed on Scottish ministers. OK, so if we leave the strategy for a minute, and I'll come back to that uh, in our next question, but in practice... Will, will we see much difference then? Or, I mean, when you say modernised, is it just more a question of modern language and, you know, a bit more up-to-date? I, I personally would, would see it as more, more, more modern language and up-to-date. Sustainable forest management is a very well-recognised, internationally known concept that's supported by both the sector and um, the, the industry and the environmental sector. So it's what happens at the moment. Um, it's underpinned by the UK Forestry Standard, which is how you demonstrate that you're meeting it. So it's, it's, it's new language. But you wouldn't see big practical differences then? We, we won't expect to see big practical differences? The, no. the, the policy is not that you would see big practical differences. The difference is that it acknowledges the multiple rules that forestry can bring, rather than having a, a series of, of little bespoke duties which over time have layered up and are quite difficult to negotiate and navigate sometimes. You have a broader duty which at, at the outset recognises the multiple benefits that can be brought. OK, thanks. So you mentioned the strategy which... At present, as I understand it, there is a strategy, but it's not actually required by statute. That's correct, And yes. we're now going to have the situation where a strategy is required by statute. That's correct. I mean, if it's there already, why do we need to put it in statute? Um, the policy to, to have a, sta a strategy in statute is that it, it requires ministers to, to have a forestry strategy to, to recognise the importance that, that forestry brings. It actually connects back to 
to your colleague Rhoda Grant's um, question in that how do, you, how do you retain skills and staff within Scottish Government? Well, if you have a statutory requirement for a strategy, you must have policies, outcomes that you're looking to gain from forestry. Therefore, you need the staff within the government to deliver those. So it's putting forestry front and centre amongst ministers' objectives and recognises the importance to the sector. Sorry, I, I just wanted to come in, if I may, there, and, and when I was looking at the bill, I noticed that the strategy will have to balance economic development and environmental enhancement, um, and, and it just says that it has to balance. So could you explain to me how you see that balance being achieved, because sometimes there will have to be a compromise on both? Um, there's actually... It, there's already a balancing objective that the Forestry Commission have to meet in terms of balancing these three pillars anyway. So it's something that already happens um, in, in terms of the strategy. I don't know. Can I bring Joe? Yeah, I mean, Joe, to... definitely come in. The thing is, it's in the bill. It doesn't say that there's going to be three pillars and it doesn't say that that's going to happen. It just says they have to be balanced. So, Joe, perhaps you could explain that a bit more. Sure. I mean, the principle of sustainable forest management is about... Um, bringing the, the social, environmental and economic together, it's well understood amongst the forestry profession and globally. And we've been working with this, as Carol said, with the UK Forestry Standard and also with the existing forest strategy. That's exactly why it was introduced. Um, I would also endorse what Carol said about the current duty. So the original 67 Act was, was about forestry, productive forestry, and over the years, other balancing duties have been brought in, and basically the legislation is catching up with what for modern forestry practice is, which, be it at a site level, at a regional level, or at a national level, is balancing all of these different um, objectives that forestry can deliver. So I think this is part of the modernisation agenda. It's the language of the legislation catching up with where modern forestry has got to. Okay, uh, Simon. Just to um, pick up on the point about, well, how does it actually work in practice? Um, uh, consultation is, is a large part of this in terms of consultation on the Scottish Forest Strategy, consultation on strategic directions for the National Forest Estate, consultation on individual uh, parts of the estate or individual f forestation forestry proposals. And uh, it's through that consultation process that uh, the nitty-gritty of what that balance uh, appropriately looks like in each case is, is worked through. Okay, I'm just going to bring Jamie in and then come back to John, if I may. Thank, thank you, Convener. Um, so I, I hear some of the language being used about this is about modernisation uh, of, of uh, forestry management. But does anyone in the panel have any fundamental concern that the fact that actually many of these functions are moving from Forestry Commission Scotland which is in effect a public body, uh, civil service role, uh, and fairly independent, moving to being under the responsibility of Scottish ministers, and ministers by default are political appointments. So is there any concern anywhere at all that this move isn't just about modernisation, but may have any detrimental effect to the independence that Forestry Commission Scotland currently has? Firing line. <laughs> <laughs> well spotted. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, so um, I'm not sure that I would um, that Scottish ministers would necessarily recognise the independence um, that you that you're talking about in terms of forestry commission. So they they are civil servants, as you as you say. Um, they work very closely with Scottish government. Um, Joe and Simon um, on a day-to-day -day basis are. Um, part of the senior management team of the directorate that we that we all work in. Um, so in in practical terms, the Forestry Commission Scotland or Forest Enterprise Scotland already operate as if they're part of the um, the Scottish Government. Okay, thank you. Uh, back to John, I think. Right, well, my final uh, question going back to the strategy was, given that we already have a strategy and there's going to be a requirement in the bill for a strategy, can we just slot the existing strategy in or would there be uh, changes that would have to be made or would it fit or could it not fit? No legal impediment to adopting the existing strategy. However, the existing strategy is now quite old and the, the land use strategy, which is current, contains a commitment to review the forestry strategy but there's no legal impediment to doing so. That's great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, the next theme is, is Stuart's. 
Uh, thank you, Convener. I think this is probably fairly brief. Um, the policy memorandum says that plant health will now be in one place. Uh, but in relation to the Plant Variety and Seeds Act 1964, uh, it's not clear to me whether it actually encompasses duties that are there um, related to the sale of plants and, and seeds in particular. So perhaps if you could clarify that for us. I will cover that. Um, the, the Seeds Act, to give it its shortest name, um, is currently not really used for forest or silvicultural reproductive materials to any great extent. So we are transferring those functions to ministers, but we don't expect a change on the ground if, if that was the, the, the point of your question, really. The, the, all of the functions in the Plant Health Act will transfer to ministers and all of the functions in the Seeds Act that are currently carved out for the commissioners will transfer back to ministers. But in terms of how they're used, we don't see an immediate change. Uh, I'm, I suppose I'm just making a rather simple point um, that they all will touch on the health of our plants. And, and while forestry is one thing, if it, there can be vectors for diseases and fungi and all sorts of things that can, adverse health events that can happen in forestry that could be derived from plants and seeds. Um, and I just want some assurance that it's all going to work together in a, in a way that serves the needs of all the different parts of the system. I, I see. C currently, most of the action that's taken to protect plants in, across the UK is through the Plant Health Act. So the import of seeds, for example, is, is governed by that. The, the Seeds Act is more about bringing things to market and, and I think the protection from the threat of plant diseases is dealt with under the Plant Health Act. So that will now all be with Scottish ministers. So everything's in one... Everything's in one place. ...big pot. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, John, you're going to... On the next uh, thank you, Convener. Yeah, I've, I've some questions on um, management and indeed uh, management to further sustainable development. And uh, the, the, the bill states that the <laughs> Scottish ministers must manage land in a way that promotes sustainable forage, uh, forest, uh, forest management. And it sets out the meaning of forestry land. Uh, I wonder could you be able to provide further clarity on two points, please? And one of them is Section 10b, which refers to, and I quote here, other land that the Scottish ministers manage for the purpose of exercising their functions under Section 9. Can someone...? Yes, I'm happy to do that. Um, other land that Scottish ministers uh, might manage for the purpose of exercising their function could be any land which is not the National Forest Estate. So Scottish ministers currently own the National Forest Estate and it's managed by Simon and his team. Scottish ministers, however, do own other land um, which could be used for a variety of different purposes. And it enables that land, for the purposes of its management, to be brought within um, the remit of this Act so that sustainable forest management might apply should they wish to plant trees on that land. The other category of land that it would refer to is land that they manage under an arrangement um, under Section 14 of the Bill, which would belong to someone else, which they manage on a contractual basis on behalf of another person. <laughs> Right, that, that was my, my second point about Section 14. Um, and how does that differ from the present arrangement, or is that consistent with the present it's, arrangement? In terms of forestry <coughs> land, it's consistent with the present arrangement. Forest Enterprise Scotland already manages land on behalf of other people. Um, and I'm sure Simon would be happy to tell you a little bit more about that. But it, it just provides the legislative under, underpinning for that to happen. So the provision enables... Um, a land management service, but also a land advice service, and those are two functions that Forest Enterprise Scotland already undertake. Okay, thank you. I can add to that briefly. So, um, the current uh, Forestry Act basically pins the entire management of the National Forest State to forestry and forestry purposes, and as the years have gone on, um, there's been a desire to uh, see us involved with a delivery across a wider set of objectives particularly because actually one third of the estate, some 200,000 hectares, is currently not forestry land, it's other land. And so as we've been um, using our, our skill sets to develop uh, agendas in terms of linking with communities, 
in terms of wider habitat management, in terms of agriculture and new entrants, for example, um, we've currently had to peg all of those in some way to forestry. Um, this proposed, uh, this bill does provide the opportunity to actually recognize the value that this other land can also deliver uh, for purposes other than forestry purposes. Okay, thank you. Yes? Or, uh, I don't want to cut across your bow, no, so no, I wouldn't mind, mind asking a question mm -hmm. on this, yeah. but if you've got more in this section, please lead on. No, um, I was going to move on to another one if you want to come okay. in. It, it's just a question, because I couldn't quite see how, the, how this all panned out, because it seems to be that land that the government owned that isn't part of the National Forest Estate now becomes part of the National Forest Estate. <clears throat> so if, to clarify my mind, um, if up in the Cairngorms they owned a, a chunk of land, would the management of that land fall under the, this Act? Would Craig Magie fall under this Act? They would still stay with SNH, or would they become part of the forest estate? No, um, under the bill, the only way to add to the National Forest Estate is to purchase land for the purposes of forestry, and then it would automatically be added to the National Forest Estate. The bill doesn't automatically add any other land that Scottish ministers own as the National Forest Estate, so it retains that status. Okay, so land that's owned at the moment doesn't fall naturally into the National Forest Estate, no. and that only land purchased or acquired for forestry falls within the management of that. After the bill is enacted, After yes. The, bill's the, way, enacted. the way to add to the National Forest Estate would be to purchase land for that, and then it will become part of the National Forest Estate, but it doesn't automatically bring the rest of Scottish Minister's land holdings or any, indeed any other public sector land holdings within what is defined as the National Forest Estate. Thank you. Sorry, I was a wee bit confused. Sorry, John, to cut across your back. No, not at all. Uh, hold on. <coughs> I, I think Peter wants uh, to come in for you. Uh, just to clarify something that Simon said there, you say that a third of the, the land, 200,000 hectares, is, is, isn't if, if, uh, under forestry at the moment. Is, is, a, is a, That seems a, a, not an awful lot of land that, that you're, you have got control over that you don't have planted. Is a lot of that land being felled and there, is, is awaiting replanting? Does that come into that 200,000 hectares? No, not at all. Um, land that's felled and waiting replanting is still considered to be forestry um, land. Mm. This is um, principally mountainous hill land, right. um, extensive peat bogs, oh, yeah. um, around 30,000 hectares of land in active agricultural use, as well as other uh, types of land, for example, riparian land and some coastal land. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, John, uh, back to you. No, no, Grant, thanks. Um, I, I'd like to, that, that was touching on... Uh, um, section 9 about the management of forestry land uh, can someone explain some differences from it between there seems to be similarities between sections 9 and 13 so the difference between the land applicable in sections 9 and 13 and um, th the terms of management of that land and when would that power actually be uh, called upon in, in terms of the the relationship between section 9 and section 13 um, section 9 is principally about forestry land, it's land that is principally designated for, for forestry, so that would include the National Forest Estate. The purpose of Section 13 is um, to fulfil the policy that Scottish ministers should be able to, um, through forest, Forestry and Land Scotland, the new ex executive agency, to have a broader land management role, so moving away from a, a silo approach of purely managing forestry. So forestry land under Section 9 should be managed for the purposes of sustainable forest management or, having had, had regard to the forestry strategy, could be used instead for sustainable development, enabling an opening up of the purposes that that land could be used for. Land under Section 13 is not forestry land, it's other land, and the purpose to which that should be managed is sustainable development. SFM and sustainable development are sort of two twin beasts. SFM is about forestry land, sustainable development applies to other land. Okay, thank you. I, I'm conscious that uh, Section 13.2a, um, or sections, they talk about compulsory purchase, but I think colleagues are going to ask questions on that, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, Mike, I think you're next. Yeah, I wonder because this is the <coughs> one section of the bill which I am struggling with. Um, for the first time, it would seem that Section 16 gives power to Scottish ministers to compulsory purchase land 
uh, to achieve sustainable development, but there's no definition of sustainable development actually in the bill. So just reading it, it says, the, the Scottish Minister may compulsory acquire land that they require for the purpose of exercising their functions under Section 9 and 13. I turn to Section 9 and 13. Scottish Ministers must manage, manage forest land in a way that promotes sustainable forest management. Um, it seems to me on reading the face of the bill that this gives incredible power to Scottish ministers to compulsory purchase land and add it to the forest estate. I mean, is that correct? I'll, there's a number of points to address, so I apologise if I take a little bit of time over this, but I think it's an important point. Um, the first point is that powers of compulsory purchase are not new for forestry. They're already in the 1967 Act. So those have been taken over and replicated broadly within this bill. If we leave that, it would be helpful under the 67 Act to define what the compulsory purchase powers were there for, because that was purely for forestry, was it? it? Was it for sustainable development? It was purely for forestry and purposes connected to forestry. Which didn't include sustainable Which didn't include sustainable development. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, that's Sorry, fine. just to clarify that. That's fine. Um, so those powers have been lifted um, and, and included in the bill. Um, as we've mentioned, one of the purposes of the bill is um, for Scottish ministers to have a broader land management role. So there's a symmetry in the bill in that all the powers that are available for forestry are available for the broader land management purpose. So if it's for that reason that the power to acquire land and the power to acquire it through CPO has been included. Um, you are correct in saying that this would be the first um, statute where Scottish ministers, purely for the purpose of sustainable development, would have powers of CPO. However, Scottish ministers and a number of other public bodies have got powers in the rural area which could relate to sustainable development. But that particular term would be new to the legislation. Um, there are checks and balances um, provided within the bill because the purpose, um, sorry, the, the underpinning legislation through which you would acquire the land through compulsion is being tapped into the 1947 Act, which is the standard procedure for how Scottish ministers exercise those powers. So that provides the checks and balances. There's also a Scottish Government policy document which sets out the purposes of compulsory purchase, and it's for those reasons that that power is in the bill. Can I just ask, therefore, <clears throat> so this is not just transferring current compulsory purchase powers under the law as it stands. It's increasing yes, compulsory that's correct. purchase powers to the minister, and I'm just a little bit exercised by the Scottish ministers, may compulsory require land that they require. So this will be up to the ministers to decide what they want to do with this. It would be up to the ministers following the procedures that are set out for all compulsory seems, purchase it powers. It seems to me to be an incredibly wide power that we are giving to Scottish ministers. Is that right? I would agree that it's a widening of the compulsory purchase power which is currently available. Perhaps it would help if Carol gave an example of something that she thinks that this might encompass so you could understand that. I can give an example in terms of forestry, in terms of... Uh, I think we understand the forestry, <laughs> it's the sustainable development. I think it would be, it's, the, the way that the powers would be exercised would be in accordance with the government's policy of the day for the outcomes that it wanted the new agency to achieve. Current policy is that the new agency is to focus on forestry, so I'm afraid I'm, at this point, I'm unable to give you a specific example of when I believe governments of, of, of the future would be able to use it. It's there, as I say, because of this desire for symmetry across the piece. That you can't seem to give an exam, you know, this is an important piece. We're talking about taking land from people who own, who own land um, for particular purposes, but you don't seem to be able to give an example of when that power would be used. We're being asked as a committee in the Parliament to give ministers this power, and yet, from my perspective, I, I, I don't see any specific examples where this would be used differently to to what the power was. I don't have any problem with what the powers the ministers have now. I'm utterly confused as what the need for this. I think we've, we've think pushed we've... Carol quite hard on that, and, and I'm happy to bring Simon in, but maybe it's something, Mike, that we could take up with the minister when he comes in. Maybe I could ask Simon to answer and then come to John Finney, if I may. 
uh, searching around in my mind for a, an example, as Carol was saying, it, looking back the way we, we haven't had these uh, situations uh, um, uh, uh, to any degree, but there was uh, an example uh, a couple of years ago where um, in relation to a designated peat bog that was, had a historic permission for peat extraction and um, it was uh, also designated as an SAC and we worked closely with Scottish ministers to try and find a solution to how to actually um, avoid that peat bog being um, destroyed by peat extraction and actually we uh, ended up getting involved in a process of, of buying that uh, that site out um, and uh, bringing it under management to restore it to favourable condition. Um, so that, that uh, wasn't a situation uh, where compulsory purchase was discussed. Uh, it wasn't a situation that pertained directly to the Forestry Act, but it is an example in my mind of the sorts of situations where, where uh, one could imagine that being one option to be considered when you said this was an important point because the members are queuing up. John, you're next. Thank you. Um, uh, sustainable is a much used and I would suggest abused uh, word. Um, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, but I wonder if it was a conscious decision not to uh, define sustainable development within the bill. It was a conscious decision. Sustainable development is a well-used term and it's used in legislation without definition. Gemma perhaps can give us some examples of recent yeah. bills where, which it's not been defined. Yeah, I'm happy to come in on that. I mean, sustainable development is not defined in the bill, but there is established case law that says the meaning is clear. It's clear to the legislature, it's clear to judges, it's clear to ministers. Um, so the, 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 the Scottish Government's view was that it, it wasn't needed to be defined. Yet the term forestry land is defined and the term national forest estate, which under, is defined. Yeah. I mean, the, the default interpretive rule, if you like, is that where a word is not defined and not all words are defined in legislation is that it will take its ordinary meaning. So it's just looking at the plain, ordinary meaning of the words. And that is the, the, the approach that a judge would take. W would it be possible then to, if I may, to share with the committee what the, the definition of sustainable development is in, in writing, then, perhaps? We'll be happy to come back to you with the, the judgment that Gemma um, referred to. Um, the purpose for defining forestry land within the bill is to give transparency to the public and to um, MSPs like yourself to identify the land which should be subject to sustainable forest management. So that there's a transparency element there in that you, the, the members of the public should be able to identify what is forestry land and therefore where ministers should be practicing sustainable forest management. Yeah, but, uh, it, um, you know, John, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm looking at you because I, I, I'm as intrigued as, where, as you are on this. You, you know, it, it may be very clear that, um, you know, a well-defined area is the National Forest Estate. Uh, that, um, and I, I hear what you say in relation to ruling. So similarly, if, if you were able, therefore, to, um, to say, um, give a definition of what sustainable economic growth is, that would be extremely helpful uh, as well. Um, um, albeit you may feel it doesn't... Uh, apply in, in this bill, um, if there's a precedent for that. that I think it, I'm, I'm thinking that it's probably quite helpful if we write to you on this point, setting out a number of definitions and, and what yeah, we No, that would be appreciated. Against. Thank you very much. I think that would be very helpful because I think we're the, the, looking around, there's a few raised eyebrows on what it means. Peter, sorry. Can I, well, I need to declare an interest because obviously I, I am a farmer now on farmland in Aberdeenshire. And my, my concern here is this is incredibly broad, I think. And, you know, what's to stop the minister on a whim deciding that he would like a chunk of my land in, in the northeast and would like to plant it? How would I argue against that if he, if he came forward and said, yeah, I quite fancy a bit of that. That would make a nice forest, but I didn't want to sell. How could I argue against that? I mean, this is incredibly wide and, and I think incredibly dangerous as well. Um, no, and, and, and if we're all saying I own a bit of land as well, so <laughs> I'm nervous about the minister. So I'll declare an interest that I have an interest in a farming partnership. And, and I suspect Stuart's going to say that he, he has a, a wee interest as well. In, do you want to just declare that? Indeed, I have three acres, which is adjacent to forest land, and therefore one might naturally yeah. think to extend. Okay, so we've all got that out of the way. Carol, do you want to come, come back on that? Um, I, I, would, um, I think the, the 
the, my colleagues who deal with policy on compulsory purchase would probably take issue with it being a whim because there are procedures for these things. Um, there are checks and balances set out, but I, I can repeat, it's, it's there because it's Scottish Government policy. We'd be happy to provide further information if we can. Compulsory purchase isn't an area that, that we lead on, but the bill reflects Scottish Government policy, which is to have these powers available for situations where you can't reach agreement. accordance with the published guidance. Um, but I think um, you've hopefully seen the circular which talks about exercising the power when it's in the public interest. So nothing would cut across that. Mm. Well, I, I, I must say I, I remain to be convinced that I, would, I, I look forward to your to written submission on, on the point, but I think this is, this is far too wide and far too broad and far too dangerous in my opinion. I think we need to, we need to give it con considerable thought going forward. Uh, I'm going to bring Jamie in and then go back to Mike, if I may. So uh, a few times have been mentioned due process. So if, if a minister decides that uh, from a, a policy point of view that a decision will be made for uh, to purchase a piece of land, what is the process the minister has to go through? Who does the minister have to satisfy to allow that to happen? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Again, I mean, compulsory purchase is something um, that my legal colleague, who's not here today, was dealing with. But um, the, the, the procedure is established in the 1947 Act that um, Carol's already referred to. Um, that sets out a procedure that's been followed on many occasions, publication requirements, um, opportunities of being heard in terms of the option of a hearing or a public local inquiry. Um, provision for a compensation. It hooks into legislation which gives provision and compensation. So these sorts of checks and balances along the way. And also, as I said, you know, this would only ever be exercised in the public interest in that that's, that's what's in Minister's published, published guidance. And, and, it's, uh, and it, it, the land need not necessarily be purchased for the purpose of forestry, but could be for sustainable development, although that is an undefined term. Sustainable correct? development is not defined, but it's not unusual not to define terms on the face of legislation. So what will happen is it will take its, its ordinary meaning. So there will be many terms and many pieces of legislation that aren't always defined. Um, and what will happen is, is when it comes to that being interpreted, you look at the ordinary meaning of the words or of the term. Um, and as I said, there's established case law in the case of sustainable development where um, one of the judges has said it's a clearly understood term. Um, and I believe um, various accompanying documents, such as the policy memorandum and, and, and the SPICE briefing, have referred to internationally accepted um, definitions of the term. And finally, what judicial recourse is available or statutory uh, options are available to members of the public if they disagree with the intentions of a minister? In terms of compulsory purchase, well, that's where the objection procedure comes in. So it's all about having an opportunity to be heard and having an opportunity to have those um, concerns put forward. Um, and I would add that this, this legislation, I mean, it is interpreted strictly by the courts just because of the nature of what it is. And it's all part of this checks and balances that um, Carol has spoken about because of the nature of the power that it is. Thank you. Right, so just to clarify, just an example I've seen in the past, if you, if you own a small patch of land and the Forestry Commission want access to their woods on the far side, in the past they did it by negotiation, they could compulsory purchase a track through the farm and they could argue that that, that is in the public interest. That's what this legislation would allow them to do. Uh, am I wrong? Sorry. Sorry. It's, sorry. The, the, the Forestry Act at the moment would allow the Forestry Commission to do that if, yeah, if, for the purpose of the, the, if the purpose was forestry. Ah, but, the only, but if there's another route, they can't do it. I but think they, could, they could say that this was under sustainable development. Maybe you could ponder I that. Think, I'll come I back to Mike. I would to like Mike, to ponder Mike. that one. <laughs> Mike, do you want to come back? Yes, yeah, so, so, thank you, convener. Oh, I've heard a number of comments that it's, um, there are checks and balances, I'm still not quite clear what they are, because it seems to me that, from what has been said, that the Minister decides what is in the public interest. Is that correct? So the Minister decides what's in the... Well, I'm asking, does the Minister decide what's in the public interest, him or herself? Um, and then uh, you said that, you know, it would only be used after negotiation, but if we give this power, if Parliament gives this power 
to enhance um, compulsory purchase to the minister, then that strengthens his hand in any negotiation with any landowner, let's say, to, about what the minister wants to, to purchase. I'm just not clear what the checks and balances are with this enhanced power that we're giving him or her. I think the best way to answer that is for us to write to the committee with a detailed explanation of the way that compulsory purchase works yeah, overall, be because that's the procedure that we're tapping into. So I think, with your permission, that would be a helpful thing to do, which sets out the way, the way that it, it works for a number of powers and for a number of, of bodies. The letter would be very helpful. I want to bring in Raida, if, if I may, just on this. Just a very quick question on, on the issue. My reading of the bill suggests that this is for forestry purposes, but the example given was the preservation of peatland. Does this, I'm, I'm not clear in the bill where this refers to non-forestry land. The, the power um, of compulsory purchase um, refers to both forestry and non-forestry land. So the forestry land is not new. The non-forestry land for the purposes of sustainable development is new under the bill. Direct me, if you can, to where in the bill that is, because my reading of it is not... Yes, section 16, um, subsection 1, Scottish ministers may compulsarily, sorry, I can't say that word very well, acquire land that they require for the purpose of exercising their functions under section 9, so that's forestry, and then section 13, which is for the purposes of sustainable development. Okay. Can I just ask one question, just on the disposal, before we move on to John Finney, is, is uh, currently the, the government's policy on disposal of land is, is that they can dispose of land to rationalise under, and this was agreement with this parliament, I understand it, they can dispose of land to rationalise, but it's got to be reinvested in the forest estate. Um, I think it would give concern um, the section 17 that uh, it just gives them the ability to dispose of land, but it doesn't put a requirement to reinvest in the forest estate. Would, would somebody care to comment on that? Okay, I can um, answer it for the purposes of the bill. Um, the Section 17 gives Scottish ministers the powers to dispose of land. Those aren't very much different to the powers, the current legislative powers that they have to dispose of land at the moment, but what is in place at the moment is a policy around the proceeds being reinvested. And I'll ask Simon to... Yes, just to clarify, um, we have two, um, uh, two uh, streams uh, for disposal um, on the estate. One is called rationalisation, um, which actually is the disposal of small uh, pockets of land and buildings that are no longer required, and we use that income to uh, fund the majority of our capital um, activity, for example, purchase of vehicles and fleet and uh, capital um, works to uh, our management buildings and the like. And then the other, hitherto called rationalisation, now being called the New Woodland Investment Programme, which is a larger scale um, sale of land um, uh, for reinvestment into principally woodland creation, but also uh, has been used to um, uh, to invest in um, examples of integrated land management with um, active farming for new entrants, for example, in the last few years. So we have the rationalisation, uh, the larger scale uh, sale for reinvestment in woodland creation, and then we have uh, the repositioning, sorry, and then we have the rationalisation, which is smaller scale to fund Forest Enterprise Scotland's capital requirements. Carol, I can see you want to come back in, but, but I'm worried about the amount of time that we have left and the amount of themes, if you want to be very brief. It was just to draw the committee's attention that any disposals of the National Forest Estate have to be undertaken in accordance with the forestry strategy. OK, so it will come in first. John Finney. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, some questions about community bodies. Um, um, Section 18 allows the delegation of the management of forestry and other land to community bodies, and 19 and 20 follow on with other... Uh, aspects of that. Uh, can you outline how the powers in 18, 19 and 20 differ from the similar powers currently in the Forestry Act? Uh, the power at 18 is a straight lift from the Forestry Act with the exception that it's not just forestry land, it's any land. Um, so again, it's a, it's a broadening out and a contribution to the community empowerment agenda. The definition at section 19 is the definition within the 67 Act, which was amended by the Parliament two years ago via the Community Empowerment Act. So it's, it's a straight lift within with a slight broadening to take account of this wider role. 
Okay, some, some other quick questions, if I may, then, please, Kavina. Um, how did you arrive at the meaning of community body um, set out in the Bill, and how does that compare with the meaning in the Community Empowerment Scotland Act? We arrived at it because it's currently law. Um, it's, it was, it's in the 67 Act, which was amended via the Community Empowerment Act in 2015, so it, it was the Parliament that arrived at that definition for forestry purposes. We have purely replicated it. Okay. Um, it is different. There are a number of different definitions of community body in statute depending on the purpose. So the Com Community Empowerment Act has got different definitions of community body depending on the purpose for which those provisions are used. Okay, thank you. Uh, the policy memorandum states um, that this is contributing to the community empowerment agenda. Can you outline how that will? The, Please. It enables communities to get involved in managing parts of the National Forest Estate. As I said, it's, it's existing law and we have merely lifted it and, and put it across. We, we saw no reason not to. No, no, it's a question, not an accusation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but presented as such. Um, I'll, yes. I'll pass yeah. to Sam. <laughs> if I can come in here, in terms of our, the current situation, our current practice, we've uh, just uh, launched a new community asset transfer scheme, which in effect um, broadens an existing uh, mechanism we had to uh, allow communities to bid to acquire parts of the National Forest Estate. That crucially increased the breadth from communities uh, of geography, local residential communities, to communities of interest, which is consistent with the Community Empowerment Act. And I, I would see these uh, provisions in the bill as being uh, enabling us to continue to operate on that on that basis rather than any um, any significant broadening of, of those uh, those powers uh, we've already brought our pr practices in line with uh, the community empowerment act and this uh, bill um, ensures that it is aligned to those existing powers Okay, that's very positive. Now, I'm afraid I'm going to have to use the term compulsory purchase again, but can, can I just ask, and perhaps this is something that you could follow up in writing if you... It, it does relate to whether land that was bought um, as a result of compulsory purchase uh, to further the achievement of sustainable uh, development. Would, uh, the, would the legislation allow ministers to de delegate the management of that land to a community body? I will follow up in writing. I, I believe the legislation would allow that, but I would need to check in terms of there are certain rules in place for after you have purchased land through a CPO, what you must then do with it, but I'll be happy to follow up on that. Okay, many thanks indeed. Well, I, I, sorry, I think it'd be helpful as well that it, it, it would, if it was no longer required for sustainable development, whether the government have an obligation to sell it back to the person from whence they, public, or they compulsory purchased it, which I believe is a law at the moment, but it would help to clarify that. Now, there's a huge lot of question on, on felling, which Richard is, is okay. going to lead on. I'm going to uh, basically put it all together, if I can. Um, policy memorandum states that whilst the Forestry Act 1967 focuses on timber, production in the new regime allows for a broader view to be taken. Consultation document include a few detail on felling regime allowing a broader view, and this is where I'll put all these together. Why does the Scottish Government feel a broader view in felling is needed? In what way are the provisions in the Bill broader than the current felling regime? And how much detail on the changes to the felling regime was included in the consultation document? And what were the respondents' views on the proposal of refelling? For all of those questions, Catherine, um, it's you. I will, I will try and keep it short as per instructions. Um, we've broadened it in the sense that we are tying all decisions taken on felling permissions, for example, back to sustainable forest management. So the old regime focuses very strongly on timber production and allowing felling for timber production, what we are doing is we are tying those decisions back to sustainable forest management. So decisions will have to be taken, we're taking a view on the balance of the three aspects that we talked about before. Um, we, in the consultation, we stated that some of the detail that is in the current act will drop down as secondary legislation. And that's what we're doing. So in terms of the detail of how it will be broadened out in terms of process in terms of what applicants can expect, that will all fall into secondary legislation and that allows us to work with the sector 
to make sure that when we talk about referring back to SFM, they understand what that means and the processes we put in place function correctly. OK, can I move on to regulations on felling? Part of the bill lacks detail, since much of the detail will be provided in regulation. We've got regulation about application for felling permission, decision for applications to fell a tree, compensation for refusal of felling permission, felling directions and restocking directions, and appeals against decisions by ministers. So why is so much of the detail on the felling regime to be included in the regulations and not in the face of the bill? And what's the timetable and process for developing and consulting on these regulations. The thinking behind having all of this detail in secondary legislation is because it is very detailed. So the Forestry Act at the moment, for example, uh, creates exceptions to the situations where you have to apply for a felling licence. And that gets into detail such as diameter of trees. Um, that is currently amended by secondary legislation when it needs to be. We've taken the view that it is fairer to the sector to work with them in the first instance to create all of those regulations. It would have been difficult for us to do that prior to the bill being published because it's quite a different framework. We will now work with the sector to put all of that detail together and we intend to have it all ready for commencement and our current working date is spring 2019. Okay, uh, on my last point, refusal of failing permission. Section 29 relates to a compensation for the refusal of felling permission. Under what circumstances might the Scottish ministers refuse an application for felling permission and what is the current process for compensation in such circumstances? The situations um, are, some, are really some of the detail that we're yet to work out, but at one end of the spectrum there are certainly situations where it would be detrimental to the environment, for example, or perhaps if there is reasons from a timber supply point of view not to fell. It's quite rare, I think I'm looking at Jo, because she's the current regulator, but I'm led to believe it is quite rare that that is refused. What is much more likely is that felling permissions will continue to be given with conditions attached that would require restocking. So this is not so much about stopping felling from happening. It's about maintaining woodland cover after felling takes place. And the, the way it's regulated now and the way it will continue to be regulated is to allow for conditions to be attached to permissions to fell and to allow the regulator to require restocking when felling has taken place illegally. That's what's currently in place. It's the basic principles now and it will continue to be. That's fine. Thank you. Do you want to come in on that, Joe? I mean, just, just that on helpful? that, I was a bit confused in, in the bill that it can refuse you permission and then it can come back and order you to fell it mm -hmm. uh, in sustainable development. So you might be refused permission for a nature conservation reason. The trees then blow over and you're, you're ordered to fell it and restock it or the majority fall over. I didn't quite understand how all that worked. I'm in on that. Perhaps it's because it's, it looks linear in the bill just because that's the way it's, it's, it's set out. But it's not linear in practice. The reason for having the ability to, to direct felling is more to avoid harm caused by trees. And again, that's quite rare. It exists already. I'm not sure how often it's used. But it's, it's a separate situation where, where you have a, a stand of trees grown for timber. You want to fell them. The, the regulation is in place to allow us to require restocking. The situation in which we would direct felling as a regulator is quite different. It's where trees are causing harm. OK, I'm noticing Jo shaking her head saying it doesn't happen very often, so uh, uh, as long as that's on the record. Mike, you want to come in and then I want yes, to move please. on? Yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> this bill is obviously directed at commercial tree felling and that sort of thing, but uh, it just struck me that in Section 23, it says a person commits an offence if the person fells a tree, a tree, unless exemptions. Can I just ask a rather silly question in a way? Um, in rural Aberdeen, there's lots of people with large one-acre gardens and with trees and everything else. I mean, I'll, I'll be bringing people like that into, into this bill. I'm shaking my head. I'm pleased to, hear, to see that. But I'm just, just as a layperson looking at reading this, a person commits an offence if a person fells a tree. 
It, 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 yes, it does look like that. The, the, reality, the reality is that the current offence is felling a, a growing tree. We continue with that, and it's just a question of construction. An offence needs to be pretty clear so that people understand when they are committing an offence. Um, on top of that, we will have exemptions, and currently those exemptions, for example, could set a, a minimum area. So we take the single tree out of the equation by creating an exemption for it. Right, and those exemptions stand in, the, in this bill and in the current law? The, they will be so set out in secondary legislation. It wouldn't apply to, to, residen to residences, you know... With this is a forestry bill. We are right. not looking at single trees. Just but the way that. it will be constructed is that we put all the exemptions in secondary legislation. I just wanted that clarification. Thank you. Who's going to come in and tell us that it's still all right to cut down the old tree for firewood? No doubt. I think I would just say, if you look at the current legislation, and I wouldn't blame if you didn't, because it is really... Very, there's all sorts of complexity in there, but that lays out all of these exemptions. In and so things like if it's a fruit tree, if it's in a garden, if it's in a if it's in a park, they are the sorts of exemptions. But they're currently in the, and that all does need more. If, if I'm honest, you know, it does need bringing up to date. And I think this is what we're talking about with the secondary legislation. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to Peter, if I may, with the next. Yeah, my, my question is about notices to comply and compliance. In Chapter 6, it, it's about registering notice to comply with continuing conditions, for instance, felling conditions and restocking conditions. And my question is, how do provisions in the bill and registration of notices to comply differ from the current system? The current system allows the regulator to enforce, broadly speaking, a failure to comply with a felling license or a felling direction on subsequent owners. What we're putting in place is a link to the existing system that we have that allows new owners to know exactly what they're purchasing. Any, any burdens, for example, that sit with that land. At the moment, there is less transparency. If you, if you were to purchase land it's depend, it depends on the seller telling you that they had a felling licence and that there are conditions that still run with that land. Um, what we're putting in place is the opportunity for the regulator to take a view as to whether those conditions should actually be put on the register so that in the normal searches that solicitors run when you are purchasing a piece of land, all of those conditions appear. So this is about purchasing a, an existing forest that's already but growing trees. But you could be trees. purchasing it at the point where everything has been felled. All right. And restocking conditions still apply. Oh, yeah. It's transparency at that point. Mm. If you were to buy a mature forest, I think you would understand what you were buying much more easily than if you were buying a, a piece of forestry land that has been felled but not yet restocked. Oh, yeah. OK, yeah, okay. I'm happy with that. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, I think you're going to go on the next one. Thank you. Um, so um, one of the uh, consequences of the new bill is the repeal of the Forestry Act 1967 in Scotland. Um, what, uh, the main thing that struck me uh, from that is the fact that um, the current act states that all activities on uh, national forestry state land must be tree related. Uh, the new bill removes that restriction. Um, is anyone in the panel aware of any other substantial consequences or implications that may occur as a result of uh, the repeal of the 1967 Act that the committee should be aware of? Um, there are um, functions which currently um, are placed on the Forestry Commissioners via the 1967 Act which um, a view has been taken are obsolete or unnecessary. I would be happy to write with a list of those, but there are some examples um, relating to activities such as um, going onto a neighbour, um, a neighbour's land, shooting the rabbits and uh, selling them back to him for the privilege, um, which we felt wasn't perhaps a, a modern policy um, directive. Um, the, in, a, in a slightly more sensible one, um, forestry commissioners um, have uh, powers to make bylaws for access at the moment um, and it's been considered that because of the um, Land Reform Act and the fact that access is now a local 
issue and Scottish ministers do not have bylaw making powers for access that those powers should not be kept for Scottish ministers. So there are some examples where the opportunity has been taken to modernise and just refresh and remove some of these obsolete functions. But say I'd, I'd be happy to provide a, a list of those if that would be helpful. I, I think it'd be helpful to get a list of things that um, are being dropped or lost <laughs> as a result of the repeal of the, the 67 Act and things which are additional or new in the new bill. So there'd be quite a clear comparison. I, I think maybe we'd find that quite helpful. Yes, we'd be very happy to do that. Thank you. And, and just uh, further to that, it, is there any view on why uh, some of uh, these additional aspects of widening scope and powers of the Scottish Ministers is falling into uh, this bill uh, that maybe should have been included in the Land Reform Act? Or why are they specifically being included here if they're not necessarily specifically re related to forestry? Um, the, the main element of the bill which is not related to forestry is the one that we've already touched on in terms of the broader land management rule. Um, that is there to fulfil a manifesto commitment um, and a policy to give Scottish ministers that wider land management rule and to establish Land Scotland as an agency, a land agency for Scotland. So the bill facilitates delivery of that manifesto commitment. Okay, and then, so the, the new forestry division will sit within the new agent, executive agency, which is... Being, no, the new no. forestry division will sit within the core Scottish Government. It will be a division of the, Scot of the Environment and Forestry Directorate. Forestry and Land Scotland will be the new executive agency, which will report to Scottish ministers. Okay, I think maybe some clarification on the uh, uh, organogram structure of how the agencies and divisions and the directorates and the ministers and the... Yep all fit together, I think, would also be quite helpful. Yeah, Thank happy you. to provide that. Um, and the final theme is John. Uh, thanks, convener. One of the most interesting aspects of any bill is the financial side. And, um, I mean, we've heard about this Forestry Governance Project Board, which I think was set up to look at the finances of devolution. It, can, it, can you explain something to us about that, and does it produce a report, or, or where are we going with that? So the, the Forestry Governance Project Board, um, it was... Uh, set up after the announcement that ministers made in 2015 um, that they had agreed with the UK government to complete the devolution of forestry. The board um, is, is chaired jointly by directors in DEFRA and Scottish government and it also has membership um, from Forestry Commission, so Joe and Simon are on it and representatives from England and Wales in terms of forestry are also on that board. The remit of that board is specifically around the cross-border arrangement, so it's not um, uh, because we, we need to agree that across the three governments. It's not um, finance within, within Scotland, so it's looking at the current cross-border functions that are delivered by the forestry commissioners across Britain at the present time and um, what, what processes we will put in place uh, collectively across the three countries for those, um, those types of arrangements in the future. And the particular finance issue um, is the fact that at the moment, the funding of those cross-border functions is, is, is by DEFRA on behalf of um, all administrations. And we're looking at how that, um, that funding will be shared going forwards. So it's a specific issue on cross-border. Okay, I understand, I mean, forest uh, research, Sc Scotland contributes 2.48 million um, to that. So is it around these kind of figures as to whether we'll be contributing more after devolution or less or whatever? The 2.48 million is specifically for um, activities that are Scottish specific activities. So where we're, ask, where we're asking forestry research um, to do something that only Scotland wants them to do in terms of research. And um, Joe might, might want to say a bit more about that. Um, what we're looking at in terms is, is the core budget also that forest research gets from, um, from DEFRA, which I think is around about uh, eight million pounds. And that covers research that is relevant to all of Britain, um, not just to Scotland. Uh, and we obviously want that research to continue going on. So Would the risk be that because we've got more than our 8.3% or whatever, population share of forestry, we might end up having to foot more of that bill that DEFRA used to fund? Um, we are still negotiating what the share of that is, but, but we would anticipate that the budget, which is currently in DEFRA, the share of, our share of that bill would, 
would come to the Scottish Government. Agreement as to what, how that would be shared out. Um, that that is still for agreement. Right. Between I, mean, I think we probably three like to be kept governments. updated on that. Yep. As that goes forward, thank you. Um, and then on the, the actual figures that I mean, the suggestion is that there's not going to be a huge amount of cost, and certainly nothing for local authorities or other bodies. But one of the big chunks that of money there is going to be is on IT. Now, whenever you mention IT at this committee, um, people get quite wound up and worried. So could you give us any comment? I, th I think the figures vary from 2.05 to 8.05 million, which does seem quite a wide range. Could you give us any comment on that? Um, yes, as, as set out in the, the finance memo, um, there are uh, the IT uh, specialists and the Forestry Commission are working with our, our Scottish Government IT specialists about the exact nature of the, the integration um, of the current Forestry Commission systems. Um, and there are aspects of that that um, they still have to fully work out, and that's why there's, there's a, a greater range on some of the aspects um, under, that, under that particular item. I mean, again, would it be fair to ask for an update, yes. convener, as, as we go forward on of that? Of course. Yes. It, might, it might also be useful to know that that is the broadest range. It's not going to go above that. Is that what you're saying? That's the broadest range that the IT specialists have, have given. OK. Thank you. Uh, that's all the questions that we've got time for, I'm afraid. Uh, there are other questions uh, which I, the clerks will marshal uh, at the end of this from various members, because I noticed some members have got questions which I haven't been able to bring in. Um, and what we'll do is we'll submit those and, and remind you also of the things that you have undertaken to respond to the committee on. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming in. In the coming weeks, we'll be taking further evidence from various uh, stakeholders. And I suspect that we may well be seeing some of you again uh, with the Cabinet Secretary uh, when he comes in to, to update the committee. So thank you very much. I'd like to briefly suspend the meeting uh, now, asking committee members to be back in in three minutes, please.
Thank you. I'd now like to move to agenda item two, uh, which is to deal with the national transport strategy. I'd like to welcome Hamza Youssef, the Minister of Transport in the Islands, Heather Cowan, uh, the Head of Transport Strategy and European Funding, uh, Bertrand Des, thank you. Sorry, I, thank you for, for helping me out. Uh, Transport Strategy Officer and Rory Morrison, the Senior Research Officer at the Scottish Government. Um, I'd like to uh, invite the Minister to make an opening, a brief, brief opening statement, if I may. Uh, good morning. Thank you, uh, Convener. I always know your preference for a brief statement, so I will make it that. Uh, the National Transport Strategy uh, Review will produce a successor strategy that will set out a compelling vision uh, for the kind of transport people and businesses want uh, for Scotland over the next 20 years. Scottish Ministers are committed to delivering a collaborative review of the NTS, one which gives partners, transport operators, local authorities, businesses, the travelling public, of course, and communities right across Scotland a greater say in influencing the development of transport policy at the local, regional, uh, and indeed, of course, the national level too. Uh, we are offering opportunities to collaborate and co-produce with our key partners through a partnership group uh, and our various working groups. For example, regional transport partnerships in COSLA will have representation in the roles and responsibilities working group, as well as the NTS partnership group co-chaired by COSLA and the governance body, the NTS Review Board, which is chaired by myself. Uh, as you will be aware, uh, convener and members, an early engagement consultation was carried out by online survey between December 2016 and March uh, of this year. Its report was published last week. The purpose of this exercise was to gather some views from members of the public and interested organisations across Scotland on strategic transport outcomes, uh, changes, challenges and opportunities for transport, and indeed the desired format of future engagement in relation to the review of the NTS. A total of 614 responses were received on the consultation, of which 538 came from individuals, uh, which uh, compares very favourably uh, to other fairly high profile strategic plans and demonstrates how much people care about transport. And there was a few emerging key themes, if I may highlight them very briefly. Uh, respondents made a number of often connected points about increasing levels of active travel, cycling and walking. This government has, of course, invested 175 million in active travel since the start of 2011 spending review and is committed to maintaining those record levels uh, in active travel. Many respondents re reference sustainability and the importance of reducing levels of emissions. This was sometimes associated with reducing the number of car journeys through the increased use of public transport and the increased rates of active travel. Another frequently raised issue uh, concerned the need for high quality and integrated public transport services as well as for the commitment to address the transport-related challenges resulting from remoteness and rurality. Uh, finally, one of the other key themes was affordability and accessibility of transport, uh, which was highlighted. In terms of uh, the progress of the review, the finding of the early engagement exercise will now be used to inform wider public and stakeholder engagement, extending the collaborative ethos of the review still further. We are in the process of developing a plan for full-scale Scotland-wide stakeholder engagement to take place from uh, later this year, culminating in a full public consultation uh, with the intention to publish National Transport Strategy 2 in summer 2019. The responses to the early engagement survey have provided a number of possibilities of how full-scale stakeholder engagement can progress through online channels, social media, existing working, working groups, forums, dedicated events, special interest groups, community engagement, and of course I would welcome any views that members have on that. Now, the very final thing uh, I would say, convener, in parallel with the NTS review team, uh, they, they've been established seven working groups, uh, as members may know, which will address key challenges and topics within the review. Uh, some of these groups have now met, uh, and the first meeting of the remaining groups will be scheduled from this month uh, onwards. These groups will meet every few months until approximately July 2018. Strategic policy options will be developed during that time and will then be tested by stakeholders and modelling works. Uh, that concludes my opening remarks. I'm more than happy, of course, to take comments, uh, questions, suggestions, and indeed advice from yourself and other members uh, of the committee. Thank you, Minister. Before we go any further, I'd like to uh, just check that there's no declarations of interest regarding to transport. I see Stuart wants to ask. Um, I'm the Honorary President of the Scottish Association for Public Transport, Honorary Vice President of Rail Future UK, 
I have no executive role in either of these bodies, but I have uh, been part of the internal consultation uh, related to what is before the committee. And I think Rada has a declaration. Yes, I am Honourable Vice President of Friends of the Far North Line as well. Okay. Thank you. And, Breda, that seems appropriate, therefore, that you lead off on the questions as well. OK. Can I ask how progress has been measured of the original national transport strategy? Hmm. I mean, I think that is fundamentally a really good question. It's part of the reason why, for example, a refresh took place. Um, and that was commissioned in, in 2015 and took place over that 2015-2016 uh, um, period. Uh, and that refresh looked at the 2006 strategy, the original strategy, which, has, again, as members will know, had those three key strategic outcomes, uh, as well as those kind of five high-level uh, objectives. Um, and so the refresh looked at that, produced in its annex, actually, uh, a table which showed how we measured up uh, how we measured up uh, since 2006 to, to, to the current day. So that's how it's been measured. Um, and, and, and in some cases, good progress had been made. In others, clearly, there was still some progress that had to be made. OK. Um, it's, it's three strategic outcomes, improved journey times and connections, reduced emissions and improvement in quality, accessibility and affordability. Can you tell the committee how it measured up on all those three? What was the outcomes? How far did it get? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's certainly worth members, I know they, they will have seen it anyway, but it's certainly worth members uh, looking again at th that table uh, that was produced as, as part of the refresh, which we can go into a little bit more detail. But I mean, I could give, of course, specific examples of, of, of where some of that uh, has worked uh, in, in relation to the key uh, strategic uh, outcomes that uh, Rhoda Grant uh, has, has mentioned. mentioned. One of the, I would say, the greatest successes, I would say, uh, that we've measured up well against has been the reduction of uh, casualties on our on our roads. Um, you know, I think we've the number of people killed in road accidents in Scotland, for example, has reduced. Uh, if I just take my numbers from 300 and, uh, from from 300 uh, to 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 200, uh, you know, a 36 percent reduction, despite there actually being a two percent increase uh, in, in, in road traffic. So certainly on the safety side, th there's been some, some good improvements. Uh, in terms of um, the use of, of other modes of transport and public transport, we know that uh, good uh, statistics and numbers in terms of the increase uh, in terms of people taking uh, the train. Uh, we know also that there's been an increase in terms of the percentage of tra trains uh, arriving on time, that PPM figure from 86% uh, in 2005, six, to, to now it sits at, uh, to, to, at uh, 91% uh, in 1516. So uh, th th there's been definitely some, some uh, positive developments. I would say there are areas where there's been significant challenges and we shouldn't shy away from that. Um, if I looked at the decline in bus patronage, for example, uh, you know that is still an area where uh, the trajectory is in the wrong direction, uh, where there's some work still to do. Although we've made some significant uh, progress in terms of reduction in CO2 emissions, uh, clearly as a government, we want to go further uh, than that uh, as well. So uh, the, the table, again, in, in the refresh would, would, would go into more detail, of course. So I think there's certainly been some successes, um, but I think we're fully aware that there's some areas where we would have to and like to go further. OK. I mean, one of the outcomes is improved quality, accessibility and affordability. I mean, how do you measure that? Some of those are, are I suppose, soft targets, which are down to perception. So how can you measure that in a way that people have confidence? It's a really good question. And what I would say to the member is, although we have that overarching national transport strategy, we have a number of, of other fundamental documents that flow from that. So one of the, one of the things I was really proud to do uh, as Transport Minister was in September, I believe, last year, when I launched the Accessible Travel Framework. I got a you know, a, a framework developed for the next 10 years of how we make our transport more accessible to those with mobility issues and disabilities and so on and so forth. Um, and, and that in itself has, uh, the document contains how we will measure that. There's a, a review group that will measure that. So there's certainly been successes that I could point to. Again, if you looked at the bus, uh, the bus industry, uh, great success in terms of, or progress, I should say, in terms of accessibility by buses, um, obviously 
very key targets that they have to meet uh, due to statutory guidelines um, and, and, and legislation that exists. Um, uh, so, so, so we know from that side. In terms of affordability, I think that's a really important point, and, and it's important to stress here in Scotland, for example, if we look at train fares, uh, we know that the government has stepped in in terms of uh, the, 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 the cap at which those fares uh, can uh, rise, and we know that as a result of that, any increase in train fares in north of the border here in Scotland has been much less than, than, than those south of the border. But that's not to take away from the fact that members of the public still feel that elements of their transport could be made more affordable. So, you know, we've tried to do that for, for example, our island communities, the introduction of RET. Uh, that has been welcomed uh, greatly by, by island communities uh, on, on the Western Isles. But rightly, again, then we get challenged from those on the, on the Northern Isles. Uh, and of course, we're taking action and committed to take action uh, on, on ferry fares. So uh, there's certainly been some successes on the affordability and the accessibility front. They are measured through documents that we have, and of course, even the franchise agreement and the ScotRail and so on and so forth. But I, I would never like to come to this committee with the impression that, uh, you know, I believe we've done everything uh, perfect and that uh, things can't be improved upon. I think things can be improved upon, and that's hopefully will come out in the, in the review process. Thank you. So the, um, the refreshed strategy in January 2016 um, uh, didn't really provide any specific policies or proposals. It was very informative in a sense that it outlined the, the changes in the landscape over the last 10 years. But really, what was the purpose of the refreshed strategy, knowing that just a few months later a full review would be announced? Um. A couple of things I think I'd probably say to that. Um, one, the refresh has helped to inform us of the reasons, rationale of why there should be a full-scale review. So it wasn't the case that before the refresh was undertaken that we knew that we were going to do a review straight after that. Um, the, the refresh looked at the evidence base. So evidence, as members will know, there would have been a fair change in, in evidence between 2005-06 and uh, when the strategy was, was produced. Uh, originally to, to, to where we got to 10 years later in 2015-16. Uh, and so it was important to refresh that evidence base that existed. That evidence base then allowed us to look at, uh, of course, the, the, the analysis of that evidence and then determine that there should be a full-scale review. If I could also, probably worth making the an obvious point for, for those around the table here, as, as, as politicians, they probably understand this, that it would have been somewhat unfair to establish a full-scale review towards the very tail end of a parliamentary term in 2015, you know, bearing in mind that this review is a two to three year review. If there had been a change in administration, uh, for example, it may have been seemed to be quite unfair for there to be a, you know, a review half the way through for a new administration would have little to be able to influence that. So I think the start of a parliamentary term, as we've done this time, the start of a parliamentary term is probably the right place to do a, a full-scale uh, full uh, review. So uh, in your uh, answer, you mentioned that one of the outcomes of the uh, interim refresh of the NTS uh, was that there is now a full-scale review. Can I ask, therefore, why it took the government 11 years to do a full-scale review of a matter of such importance, given that it's 614 people or, or uh, organisations responded, surely is a testament to the uh, uh, the scale of the uh, interest um, that uh, their views and voices were heard. It seems like a, a, a terribly long uh, tale, uh, given the other um, policy documents are generally refreshed on a much more frequent basis, such as every five years. I'm happy to explore that within the, the context of the, the review that's ongoing and uh, whether there should be any statutory time for, for review. I have to say I'm not inclined to, to go that way. My gut tells me that's not probably a good idea. And the, the reason for that is if you look at the current strategy, there is the ability to have a, a review every four years. And I know that in 2010, uh, there was discussions with what was known as the, the, the NTS stakeholder group, so that includes all the organisations that you'd expect it to, from COSLA right the way through to CBI Scotland, uh, the STUC, passenger organisations, commuter uh, interest organisations represented, and they took the view that in 2010 a review wasn't necessary. So in that kind of collaborative 
um, approach that we took. Um, of course, the decision ultimately for ministers, but in consultation um, with that stakeholder group, it was decided that a review wasn't necessary. So the, the NTS was still very much relevant. Um, people know that in transport, you know, that's why we take a 20-year review of the national transport strategy because you know it is a long game uh, that uh, that we're involved in when it comes to transport, changing behaviours, making transport uh, um, improvements. So uh, you know that 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 was not a decision that was taken just by ministers. It was taken, and I hope I can give the member assurance on that. That, that that was taken at the time with with consulta consultation with the national transport uh, strategy stakeholder group. So uh, you know I, I think now it would be fair to say you know ten years on from that we're very much at the place where um, all stakeholders think that review is a good idea. So again this is not just a ministerial decision to review the national transport strategy. You know there, there's certainly when I meet with RTPs, COSLA, SOLIS, and many other stakeholders, there's a real yeah this is the right time for a, for a review. So you know I, I don't think that uh, th th there's any uh, difference of opinion in that. Um, yeah. So to, I appreciate your, your frankness to answer. So just, just to clarify for the record, it wasn't a ministerial decision not to have taken uh, a review in the last seven, eleven years. It was the national transport strategy. I know. I think I said. The, I think in some respects, I, I said that ultimately ministers take that decision. So as you know, it's a Scottish government strategy. It's up to ministers whether or not there's a review, there's a refresh, or there's any tinkering of that. So ultimately, of course, it's a ministerial decision. But uh, I hope I gave the impression that it was done in collaboration, stroke consultation, uh, with the NTS stakeholder uh, group uh, at the time. Um, I, would, I would have to go back to. 2010, think who the Minister for Transport necessarily was at the time, but um, you know, you could obviously ask him. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, from my, my, my briefing uh, it suggests, of course, that the NTS stakeholder group uh, was consulted, uh, collaborated. I'm not saying that everybody, necessarily all of the stakeholders, uh, had the same opinion. I'm sure that wouldn't be the case with as many uh, stakeholders that there, there are on that group. Um, but certainly taking advice from them, the minister then at the time took the decision, I think, absolutely rightly, that there wasn't the need for, for a full-scale review after four years. Um, uh, thank you, Minister, for doing that. I'm now going to have to bring him in. Um, so Stuart's going to ask you a question. Uh, just on the back of that, uh, Minister, um, given that the current uh, national Stra transport strategy actually has Tavish Scott's signature at the bottom of it, um, does this not illustrate that this is the kind of document that is representative of a consensus that exists and setting out a long-term view of where we're going um, is something that we ought to be able to find common cause on, as I think... Um, a previous transport minister, possibly even myself, picked this one up and, and, and ran with it. And that really our disagreements and differences of views are more likely to come when we examine specific projects rather than the overarching strategy where yeah. it ought, as I think history tells us, to be able to reach a high level of agreement. Yeah, and I think that's absolutely correct. I won't add too much to it in that uh, you know, credit where credit is due to the previous administration, to, to ours, that coalition. Um, government at the, at the time uh, clearly put together a document that has stood the, the test of time. I think it's a document that is well respected. When I speak to, um, for example, uh, chief operating officers of transport right across the country, they really respect and, and hold uh, in, in, in high regard the national transport um, strategy. Um, but, you know, I'm aware we're one day away from an election, so I shouldn't praise the opposition too much. Um, but uh, <laughs> despite uh, Mr. Rumble's uh, protestations, otherwise, I, I think it's, I think uh, it does stand the test of time. And that's the purpose, purpose of the review. I think we, may, we want to take it forward in a collaborative approach as possible. And, and that's also been a learning exercise. I mean, COSLA had come back once or twice to me as a minister to say, you know, we think we should be represented on this group or co-sharing this or other stakeholders said that. And, and I've demonstrated my willingness to be as open as possible uh, to that process. And you've got to try to find a, a balance between doing that and then having death by committee where there's far, far too many stakeholders to be able to make a decision or too many working groups to, 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 to function. I think we've managed to strike that uh, balance and strike that balance well. Um, fine. I, I don't recognise that death by committee. I'm sure that wasn't referred to here. John's got the next question. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, I mean, assuming there are some changes to the national transport strategy uh, as we go through the review, um, would that, would, does that have a, an impact on the day-to-day -day decisions of 
the government and of Transport Scotland um, if there are changes? Uh, yes, inevitably, uh, it could uh, potentially do that. I mean, the, the, the National Transport Strategy is, of course, an, an overarching document, high-level uh, document, uh, the day-to-day -day decisions that we make on uh, a variety of investments or, or indeed transport uh, decisions uh, will be informed by the context of those issues on an issue-by-issue issue basis. Uh, but the National Transport Strategy certainly provides the outcomes, the high-level uh, uh, outcomes that we want to try to, to, to achieve. There are, of course, other documents. The National Transport Strategy is, is one. Um, the STPR is one that a lot of members have an interest in as well, which, you know, that strategic transport projects review, you know, very, is of great importance to members in terms of the investment of, of strategic transport routes in their particular region uh, or, or constituency. So uh, I've got no doubt that the of course, the, the, the review uh, will uh, focus our thinking uh, on government, but it should be said it's at a high level as opposed to the maybe perhaps everyday decisions that have to be made uh, that affect members around this, around this table. Okay, thanks. Um, I think you said summer 2019 was the target date for mm -hmm. the, uh, the new strategy. Can you just give us uh, a bit of detail about how what happens between now and then, and uh, how people, stakeholders, can feed in, all that kind of thing? Yes, uh, in terms of how stakeholders can, can feed in, uh, um, we're doing a little bit more work on that, and that's on the back of the, uh, the early engagement. Um, and so once I have a little bit more of a firmer view, of course, I'm more than happy to, to write to the member uh, on that. In terms of what will happen between now and, and, and summer 2019, um, uh, you know, I'd say to members not to necessarily hold me down to every single month here because this is a, an approach that will be collaborative. But you know, between now and, and, and 2018, as well as the call for evidence we've already had, there is also a call for evidence from one of the working groups um, uh, at the moment in terms of the, the, the research group uh, that we have. Um, we've got seven working groups and they'll continue to work and, and meet uh, between now and July 2018, those working groups, seven of them, um, again, I can give details uh, to the members uh, on that, but they're, func they're split up into functional groups and, and thematic areas and thematic groups. Between 2018 and 2019, so strategic policy options will be developed from January 2018 until July, um, uh, uh, until July uh, of that year, uh, collated in August uh, 2018. These options will then be tasted, tested, not tasted, be tested by stakeholders. Um, a monitoring framework to enable the monitoring of the NTS2 will be de developed between August and December 2018, and that will include, likely to include, uh, key key performance indicators. Uh, the draft national transport strategy will then be produced in January 2019, followed then by a consultation period between February and May of that year, with the NTS document uh, two due to be developed in summer 2019. So essentially, to, to boil all that down, uh, why we've got the working groups reporting back to, to, to the review group is that uh, by the time we get to the consultation in early 19, uh, really, we should have a pretty solid draft that has been informed from the grassroots up from stakeholder engagement right the way through to public engagement right up and down the country. So by the time the consultation comes, we should hopefully have a good idea of how that transport strategy is going to look. But just to road test it, we'll go through that final consultation period um, beforehand. But, you know, it is, it is a two to three year project precisely so it allows us to get into the depth and the meat of, of some of these issues because you know each of the issues that is going to be discussed, I know this from each mode of transport, um, you know, has a hundred and one different issues that you could spend uh, quite a considerable of time uh, delving into. So it is important that we take our time at taking that strategic um, and evidence-based uh, approach. Okay, that's very helpful. Thanks much. And finally, I mean, to kind of follow up the, the line of uh, questioning that Jamie Green had, as to you know what's happened between 2006 and now, uh, I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts about what would happen, you know, from 2019 onwards, because I suppose my gut feeling is, you know, I quite like things to be, you know, ha they're reviewed after five years or they're reviewed after ten years or there, there's some kind of plan in there, and, and I mean it just seems to me just a, it's been a little bit vague for the last 11 years as to what was happening at what point. Mm. Yeah, again, I think that will be certainly part of the work that we're doing with the review, I think we are very aware, and I'm certainly I'm very aware as the minister, that the monitoring uh, can be a little bit more robust and could be strengthened for NTS2 as compared to the current strategy. So although it was done in collaboration with the stakeholder group, I think perhaps firming up when reviews, when refreshes should happen, 
um, and, and taking a, a slightly more, as I said, a kind of KPI approach uh, is one that I'm, I'm, my instinct and my gut is that we should move down that route to give confidence. But I don't want to make that decision unilaterally. I want to, uh, of course, work with the review groups and, and other stakeholders on that. But I accept the member's point, and I think it's one that he and, and Jamie Green uh, made fairly well, and it's one that we're aware of, so I can give him at least that reassurance. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, John. Thank you, good evening. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, good morning, Minister. Minister, you, you alluded to the Early View survey, and uh, looking down the list, uh, uh, an analysis identified 11 key themes. I have to say, it's, it's, it's very, very positive. Promoting cycling, walking, active travel, environmental issues, including reduced emissions, high quality integrated public transport, rural and island transport, affordability and accessibility. It reads like a, a green manifesto. Um, I wonder, can you say, um, what was the purpose of the online survey launched in 2016? And how will these responses influence the development of the revised NTS, please? Uh, I'm not going to take the bait a day before the election uh, at the manifesto, but it's a, it's a point uh, well made. I think that there's a, uh, certainly a real interest now, wherever I go, whatever the mode of transport, whatever the topic on transport, that active travel is mentioned, um, certainly is an integral part of the discussion. Uh, you know, whether I'm talking about ferries and people are talking to me about bike storage, whether it's trains and equally the same, same situation, uh, whether it's about duelling on the roads and our infrastructure projects, what is the active travel component to that? Um, almost in every discussion I have, active travel seems to be a key part. So I think the point that he makes um, about this being um, at the forefront of people's mind is, is, is certainly one that I would agree with. And I'd be interested actually to speak to Tavis Scott at some point about whether or not he felt it was um, is, 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 uh, is key consideration for him in 2006 is, is, is clearly going to be for, for us um, because I think there has been a, a change in people, certainly in it, we've seen it's changing people's mood in terms of uh, uh, demanding action and, and active travel uh, that might not have been quite to the same same level in 2006, but I'd be interested in that conversation. Uh, in terms of uh, his, uh, his, his direct question, um, the, the uh, partnership group, uh, we, we've already discussed some of the, the findings of the early engagement. It should be said that the call from evidence wasn't just something uh, that we decided to do, that we thought was a good idea, um, and, and the topics were chosen by us. Uh, this was very much uh, something that was uh, that, that, that came forward from our uh, the research and uh, review group. Uh, you know, they they were the ones who suggested that uh, these are the kind of topics that we might want to look at and examine. I think looking at the responses, looking at the key themes that have come back. Uh, they probably got it right. I mean, I'm pretty impressed by 600 plus um, responses. I look at other transport strategies that we've put out, and in fact, even other strategies across government, and, and, and this uh, actually exceeds uh, quite a quite a number of them. So clearly, the topics that were chosen to 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 have that early engagement on uh, certainly seem to be um, garner some public interest. Uh, th thank you. Minister, you, you, um, you'll be aware that survey respondents were particularly concerned that the revised NTS focused on the development of safe cycling and walking networks. Um, now, earlier on, uh, you talked, if I note you correctly, of committed to maintaining record levels of funding for active travel. Um, and I hope that will be in the next um, budget settlement because, of course, we'll have a real terms reduction in active travel in this one. Um, how will the development of walking and cycling networks feature in the revised? NTS, please. Well, uh, you know, happy, of course, to get green support for, for that budget, and uh, I'm sure that was one of the considerations of, of support uh, was the record level of uh, investment in active travel, which we've committed to do over the parliamentary term. But I've got no doubt that the member will, as other members will, push the government to always go further to look for more money to spend uh, on that. Uh, I know of the the Greens' um, own view uh, necessarily on that. And as a minister, as the minister in charge, I would certainly say that um, where I can find additional spend for, for active travel, uh, I'm certainly open-minded to doing that. Uh, in terms of uh, how the NTS2 will, uh, will, uh, will look to take this agenda forward, obviously that will come out of the review process and, and discussions. All I can give the member a very certain reassurance on is that it's a key consideration for us. Uh, we're saying that Sustrans are 
are part of that uh, review group, that very high level review group that I uh, chair. Um, and so, you know, th they certainly have a, a seat at the top table, if I can, if I can put it that way. Um, in terms of my own thinking on this, I, I've been very public on the record. In fact, even in front of this committee, uh, of the importance, I think, of, for example, segregated psychopaths and and, and how important that is for increasing active travel uh, and we have an active travel task force that is looking at some of the issues at a local level and also a national level that may be barriers to uh, to, to to cycling infrastructure. So all of that will feed into to the NTS review, but there's certainly no shortage of um, active travel organisations represented at the, 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 the NTS uh, working groups, but also um, as part of the review group um, as well. So I can give the member absolute assurances that it's very much at the forefront of our are thinking. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, there's a follow-up on that from John. Yes, I mean, just, just following on from some of the things John Finney's been saying, I mean, the, the term safe cycling and, you know, clearly there has been a little bit of a, what would you say, a clash in Edinburgh between, you know, improved public transport, the trams, and certainly claims by cyclists that, you know, their safety has been compromised in order to get the trams running. I mean, is this something that would be reflected at this level or is that something that would be looked at at a different place? I mean, specifically on, on the issue that he's, he's referring to in the very tragic incident that took place in terms of the, the cyclist uh, who was killed after um, going over, over tram lanes. I know uh, Edinburgh City Council and Transport for Edinburgh are, uh, of course, they have responsibility uh, for, for, for that and they are taking that responsibility incredibly seriously, having uh, said that they will look again um, at what safety provisions can be made uh, on the tram network. Uh, for cyclists and indeed for pedestrians. So I think we should give them the time and the space to do that good work and have uh, a lot of time uh, for, for Transport for Edinburgh. I think they're, they're, they're a really excellent um, uh, organisation. So I think it's important to give them the, the time and the space to do that. In terms of the, the, the working groups, I mentioned there's seven working groups. One of the thematic groups is delivering safe and resilient transport. I'd mentioned some of the successes in my uh, remarks to, uh, I think it was Rhoda Grant, about the reduction in fatalities in our roads, for example. But also looking at the flip side of that, there's clearly some work to do when it comes to safety for cyclists. Um, they've been identified as one of the most vulnerable groups on the roads, along with pedestrians, uh, along with older drivers, young drivers and motorcyclists. Um, you know, they're in amongst there as, as one of the most vulnerable groups. And, um, you know, it's certainly something that uh, keeps me awake, um, you know, when I, how can we reduce the serious incidents and indeed fatalities that our cyclists face? Because cyclists, you know, cycling is becoming more popular. I want it to become more popular. Um, but certainly for me, having segregated psychopaths is a part of that. That's why I find it uh, such an important, uh, for me, it's such an important issue to get that right. So it will be considered as part of the, the thematic group that I've talked about there, the, the uh, delivering safe and resilient transport. But even out with the review process, it's something that takes up rightly uh, a lot of my attention and is one that, uh, you know, we're not going to wait for the review process to necessarily continue to do work on this agenda and give the member an, an absolute assurance that it's one that we're continuing to work on. Um, Richard. Good morning, Minister. Um, Transport Scotland has established a research and evidence working group. I noticed that there are four members from... Transport Scotland on it, including Mr Rory Morrison, who's sitting at the end there, and I, I want to target my questions to you, Mr Morrison, uh, after the Minister's answered this one. How did we make up, and I noticed there are four professors on that, two, uh, on that group, two from England and two from Scotland. Uh, how did we settle on, uh, are these people who are proficient in their field in the gas transport? Um. Well, I would say a couple of things, uh, if I can. Uh, you know, the, the, the need for this group is, is really important, research and evidence, and we always want to take an evidence-based approach to, to what we do uh, in government. And the refresh in 2015-16 showed that the evidence base could be more robust for the work that we do. Um, and I attended a presentation recently by one of the members of the, uh, the research and, and evidence group, Professor Tom Rye. Uh, it was at the uh, Scots AGM, Chief Operating uh, Chief Officers of Transport in Scotland. Uh, it was an excellent uh, presentation, and, and perhaps I uh, wonder whether it can be uh, whether we can ask him to, to share it to, to members of the committee, because it really spoke about how 
uh, there needs to be a better evidence, an academic evidence base that can be tested at an academic level uh, for the decision, for the presumptions and assumptions that we make um, about transport. So I found it to be uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, so the need for that research and evidence group is is hugely important. As I said, they they you know they were uh, very much involved in uh, our consideration for what should go out in terms of a call for, for for evidence. They also have a call for evidence themselves, of course, which closes uh, in July uh, of of this year. But um, you know, for me. Uh, I mean, uh, each of the, the the academics on that group um, are certainly recognised, <clears throat> particularly as I say, Tom Rye, but uh, you know all of them, and including, of course, very much the chair uh, of being people of, of extremely high calibre, well respected within the transport uh, industry. But I'm happy to pass, as the member wanted, to, to Rory to, to perhaps add to that. Uh, the question <coughs> I actually wanted to ask uh, uh, Mr Morrison was, what, what do you believe is the purpose of the Research and Evidence Working Group? Do you have carte blanche to take evidence to aid this review? And will you be taking, talking to users, stakeholders, all the people who use basically transport in order to formulate your uh, review back to the Minister? Sure. So there's, <clears throat> there are several parts to that. So I'm an analyst for Transport Scotland and I provide the secretariat to that group and I'm um, kind of part to organise it. Um, to, I mean, just to reiterate the Minister's comments, the, the academics that were chosen were selected partly because they are senior academics in their field. They offer a good coverage of the kind of issues, strategic transport issues that are, the review will um, uh, touch upon. So um, Gillian Annabel's areas of research, who's the chair, include demand-side solutions to uh, reduce carbon and energy use in transport. Um, we have people who are um, members who are interested in the societal implications of autonomous vehicles and other um, uh, new mobility solutions. Um, obviously, no four people can represent um, transport research is a very, very broad field. No four people can represent um, everything completely and have that depth of knowledge, but they do have a broad um, understanding of uh, the types of work going on in the in transport research more generally and can connect the research and evidence group into other existing ongoing research. So um, in terms of the function, the function is, well, there are several parts. Um, one is to uh, manage the call, this call for evidence that was open in um, April and uh, closes at the end of July. But this they serve a function throughout the review in terms of a scrutiny and challenge function on the use of evidence. So um, both being able to respond to ad hoc request <coughs> requests from working groups on issues of evidence and, and questions around research, and also to kind of scrutinize the, um, the, the evidence used in the formulation of policy. Uh, it has an, an external chair, so that does emphasize that it does have a, a aut autonomy um, separate from the policy making um, aspects of the process. Okay, Minister, can I ask you, how will the eventual output of the research and the evidence working group be used in the drafting of the revised national transport strategy? And how would you deal with a situation where the evidence provided by the group was at odds with either your thinking or the current Scottish Government policy? I think we have to be relaxed on the latter point about the fact that um, you know if, the, if there's evidence um, and indeed uh, suggestions from other working groups uh, that uh, policy direct they, they have suggestions of policy that might directly conflict with government policy then you know we have to of course uh, at the time make a consideration about how we deal with that um, you know I don't suspect that there'll be huge conflicts I mean we're doing this in a way that is grassroots but also collaborative so you know we are helping to inform but also be informed uh, in that process but where there are potential I don't know I wouldn't put it as conflicts but where there are suggestions that we should um, focus our energies greater on one particular aspect of transport or perhaps give further consideration to aspects then you know we have to be guided by that um, you know there's no point going through a two to three year review process that is in depth as this is going to be if we're not going to take on the the the, the outcomes and the and, and and the advice from stakeholders on that and and the fact that it'll be backed by evidence and research 
um, will will of course give that even more um, uh, give that firmer uh, more more strength more robustness. And as I say, there's simply no point as a government minister instructing review and then choosing to ignore it. So I think we give it the, the proper consideration that uh, it merits. Glad to hear that. Thank you. Um, okay, and the final question uh, is appropriately with Stuart. Um, thank you, Convener. Uh, the previous uh, Scottish Transport Projects Review, I remember extremely well. I can't quite remember, I think it was 3,600 pages, or it was of, certainly of that order. Um, is an, an, under 29 broad headings. Uh, how is what's currently going on in the National Transport Strategy going to inform uh, the new STPR and uh, timescales? I think we had a little bit about timescales, but ha have we yet set a date for when we might bring forward the STPR? The only thing we said about the timetable of the STPR too would be that it can be concluded in this parliamentary term. And I think the reason for that, and I, I do appreciate that it, in some respects members will see that as, a, as, as vague, but the reason for that is that um, clearly we need to have the overarching national transport strategy, so the NTS2 complete quite substantially before we, we make any, any major progress on the review of the STPR. So the STPR that currently exists is a document that's live, that's relevant, um, I think very good document uh, as well, and again one that when I travel across the country is held in, 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 in very high uh, regard. But um, you know, some preliminary work on STPR2 has already uh, commenced to help with the review of, of, of NTS. Um, that work, for example, include development of future transport scenarios, setting out what transport in Scotland might well look like. Um, but clearly, we should wait for that overarching 20-year vision of transport before we then delve into to, to what STPR2 will look like. So, um, as I say, the intention absolutely is to conclude it during this parliament and starting some of that pre preliminary work means that we can get moving on that uh, soon after uh, NTS2 uh, is published. I think that's it, can we Okay. Uh, I don't think there's any more uh, questions, Minister. So unless there's anything that you particularly want to raise that w we've, we haven't questioned you on, I, I'm happy to give you a very, very brief uh, chance to feed in. Uh, no, the, the only thing, th thanks, Convener, for um, the questions. I mean, the only thing I would really add to that, I appreciate the fact that we sent um, detail of the, the, the uh, analysis of the early call for uh, evidence and, and so on to you just last week. And I know mines will be focused uh, elsewhere, but certainly uh, once the dust settles on, on elections and so on and so forth, I'd be very keen to hear from members um, not just their priorities on what the NTS2 should look like, of course, which we all delve into, no doubt, between now and, and, and summer 2019, <coughs> but also if they feel that there should be um, uh, how we should do uh, public engagement, I'd be very keen to, to hear from members on that, uh, no doubt in, in their own geographic and regional areas of interest, uh, but also perhaps wider across Scotland. I'd be very interested in that. I think. Uh, uh, there'll be huge amounts of interest in the NTS2, um, and I think uh, making sure that everybody has an involvement in that uh, is something that I'd be very, very keen to, but uh, really nothing more for me to, to add. Thank, thank you, Minister, and I, I also should thank you for, for bearing with us because we're a little bit late uh, calling you in uh, due to previous work we were doing, so thank you for bearing with us on that. Um, and. Uh, uh, that really concludes our committee's business. Uh, I'd like to conclude the committee's meeting, but ask members to stay behind for a moment afterwards. So thank you very much, Minister. <laughs>